they're sitting on a shelf looking so pretty and perky and beautiful and they just want someone to love them but nobody does and then one day somebody comes and puts a sticker on there that says we don't want you anymore we're reducing your price what are you gonna do go rescue the vegetables Hi folks, it's Darcy from The Purposeful Pantry and today we're going to talk about how to save money to make vegetables shelf stable to put in your pantry. When prices are so high right now, this is a great way to take advantage of some of those sales that you find to put food on your pantry shelf to make things much less expensive than if you purchase them full price. Now granted, some of these vegetables have had a bit of a life before they came to be in your home. They've let go of some of their vitamins and minerals. You're gonna have some loss because you do that with anything. But what you're doing is you're still capturing what's there, what's available, and as long as they're not slimy and smelly and don't look good to eat, then you can dehydrate them and put them on your shelf. So yesterday I went to the grocery store to just walk through the produce section as I do every time I go to the store to see if there were any clearance vegetables sometimes I'll find some sometimes I won't okay so what I found were two bags of organic chopped kale that I found three tubs of baby bella mushrooms that are already sliced I found a package of um, pomegranate arils which we like to eat these fresh but we also like to eat these dried then I found this little party tray of vegetables you can of course eat this if you want this could be an addition to your meal tonight or tomorrow but if you're trying to build pantry stock doing clearance vegetables is a way to do it so of course the first thing you want to do is always wash your greens so i've got the greens in some water to wash them off i've added about half a cup of vinegar because what we're looking to do is just make sure that anything that's on here that can come off will come off next i'm going to go ahead and start blanching our vegetables Blanching helps protect the color, helps stop the enzymatic process that makes food go bad on the shelf, which they lose their color and just start losing their nutrients that you need. You don't have to do this when you're dehydrating greens because likely the likelihood is you're going to be putting those greens into something you're cooking anyway, so that, that will still happen. So that's not necessary to blanch them. Broccoli just needs a couple minutes and it's done, and then you're going to put them right into an ice bath. Green beans take about four minutes, and what you're supposed to do when you're blanching food is you wait till this comes back up to a boil and then start your process. But because these are smaller, I'm not gonna worry about that. We're doing a four minute timer period. While we're waiting on that first batch of carrots, I'm gonna go ahead and start getting my tomatoes ready to make little sun-dried tomatoes. Now, granted, are they really sun-dried? No, but we're dehydrating, kind of like doing little tomato raisins. But you can also always Rehydrate them in a little pot of simmering hot oil. When you're ready, maybe you want a sun-dried flavor. That's how you do it. When I load my tomatoes, I always do them skin side down, cut side up. You want the air going across the surface of that tomato. And if you're using any kind of mesh at all, if you put it down flat, then what you've got is a bunch of surface area that's not drying. So do it skin side down, cut side up. And if you wanna make these snacks, you can certainly sprinkle on some nutritional yeast, uh, some seasonings of your, of your, your choice. Uh, they can be ready for that at any point if you wanna snack on them and just use them that way. Um, I typically don't season these because that way they're useful for whatever I want to do them for. Now, because if I used a bigger pot and put all this in at once, I could have done the snap peas and the carrots together. They would have, they do about the same amount of time. The broccoli could just go in on its own really quickly and I would save time that way. But in the course of about 20 minutes, I'm gonna have this dehydrator full of food ready to go. All right, now I'm gonna work at cleaning my greens. That's how much liquid came out realize I know I have enough shelves to do all shelves to do all of this on their own individual shelves but I'm not quite sure how the greens are gonna go so I'm gonna give myself a little space and put my pomegranates on with my tomatoes now if this is all I had purchased I would have just eaten them we would have saved them for fresh eating but because we're doing the whole thing on how to process your fines I'm gonna dry it all all right, you can pile your greens on pretty heavily because they are gonna shrink massively. And here's a cool trick. If you have a dehydrator that you have slide in shelves and they don't have enough space that when you wanna do greens like this, you have to take a shelf out, don't do that anymore. Take another sheet of mesh, press it down. 
press it down really well. When you go to insert this into your, your machine, it will just slide right in. Everything will stay compact. It will dry just as normal. Uh, this works better with the plastic mesh that is for, for food grade dehydrating versus the silicone mesh, which can get caught because it just grips, but it works like a charm. Now here are a couple tips for you. If you're doing kale and your, your, your main process is to go straight to powder, you can blend this up in a blender and then get it into a, a puree or in your food processor, grind it down to a lot smaller pieces. And you can do that in order to uh, make kale powder that you're not doing full leaf. Uh, you can also blanch this ahead of time. It will reduce the size of it and you can do that as well. And if you wonder, can I dehydrate a whole baby carrot? In fact, you can. But I am going to chop this down into four. No, I'm not. I'll do it this way. This is faster. When we were newly married, money was hard to come by to feed our family, our growing family. Uh, and I would find these sales whenever I could and freeze everything. Since then, uh, you know, I learned that I can't freeze everything because, you know, you were not a freezer space and if you want things to be shelf stable so that you don't have to worry about any kind of power outages creating a problem, you know, preserving a different way uh, is what I needed to learn how to do. Canning was always scary to me. Even though I'd done a little bit with my grandmother, I never really learned how. Uh, and it always was daunting to me. But when I found dehydrating, this is a way that I just... It's easy, it's quick, I can integrate everything, and then if we don't like something, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna powder it and make it really useful for us. Okay, so I don't have quite enough room for the snap peas, so we'll do those on a separate tray with along with some of the kale. Now what can you do with the snap peas? You can season them and get them ready to snack on when they're done dehydrating. You can leave them like this and put them in meals, like maybe you're doing some kind of soup or casserole or a soup or a stew that you like to have these in that they can have some long cooking time to rehydrate and cook. Uh, there are many ways that you can use them. And because my kasori doesn't have quite as much space in the tin tray as the six tray, I'm gonna go ahead and start unpacking a couple of these to give myself a little room. because I don't have the plastic enough plastic mesh to do this and the silicone is sticking a little too much. So we're gonna try to spread some of this out a little bit so I don't have to lose a tray. All right, so here's some practical tips. I did take out some of my kale uh, and the rabbit is gonna benefit. It was just a little too packed for the density that I can get into the Kasori 10 tray. The six tray has about that much space, so I can do it a lot easier. And I know people with Excaliburs have even a little less space. So I didn't wanna remove a tray between these because I, didn't, I don't have that ability. I need to get this dry today. So I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it that way. And I know those of you who followed me and know that I really advocate doing mushrooms separately from all of your other food because the possibility that mushroom spores transfer to your other food is a possibility. However, I'm gonna tell you, these were not picked live. They have been on the shelf for way too long. The, the spore issue on here is zero almost, okay? So I'm not worried about this so much. And then what else have I done? I have mixed mushrooms with greens, with vegetables, and with what some people might do is fruit, okay? Now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna push this back, stay in your own lane. Uh, I'm gonna dry them all low. Now maybe I'm not gonna do 95 like I would normally do for greens and herbs because I don't have that kind of time. I need these to dry a little faster, but I'm also not gonna raise this up to a fruit temperature because fruit can dry at a lower temperature. It just takes a little longer. So we're gonna set this for 115. We're gonna kind of just 
Nah, maybe there. Okay, we're gonna set it for 118. I don't set a time ever because I don't go by what the time on the machine says. I go by where the things in here are actually done. So I check on them often and then we're gonna get started. So am I gonna waste all of the kale that I couldn't get on the trays that I just had to pull off? Nope, we're gonna put these in the refrigerator and my rabbit's going to also enjoy some of our find. Plus, the next thing, this blanched water. What do you do with it? You're just gonna to toss it out? Now what I wouldn't do is reuse water that's in the sink necessarily, unless you're gonna, uh, if you're okay with whatever might be in it, I might use it to water my plants, but definitely the water that we blanch with is gonna go water our plants. Here we have mushrooms, completely dry and breakable. Here is the broccoli. Here are our carrots. Here is our kale. See how much it shrunk down when drying? Here are our green beans. They did turn dark, but that's okay. They will be better. And here is, here are our tomatoes. These are lovely little dried tomato slices I mean, it halves that can be uh, stored as they are. And then you can put it, and then I'll show you what you can do with them later. And then here are our pomegranate seeds, which are a bit of a fail. If you look at it as I set the timer for what it's supposed to be, the timer went off. They're not done. What do I do now? What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. They need more time. So what are you supposed to do with all of this now? Let me show you. So typically I tell you that you also need to condition things before you store them because conditioning is where you can check to make sure that everything is fully dry exactly the way it's supposed to be before you put it away for storage so that you don't run into it an issue of having things get soft because you didn't get everything dry fully. Um, and I recommend it for just about everything before storage. However, today I'm not going to condition any of this and here's why. Just like practicality with putting this stuff up in your dehydrator and mixing the temperatures here, when it actually wasn't a safety issue, what I'm going to do with this stuff, because I'm not conditioning, is this, this has been drying for over two days. Um, when I first put it in, um, I had all the plans of getting everything done when they were supposed to be done, putting things away when they were supposed to be put away. But then uh, we had um, some things happened with my dad and then we started working on more of the garden space that took up all of my time and I couldn't come finish this up so I just let it dry. So if this had to run a little longer than needed, I'm okay with that. It's fully dry. Okay, the only thing that's not are these pomegranates. They're going to need some more time. So now all the kale is going to go into a bowl because I'm going to do a couple of things with it but I need to just get it gathered up and set aside. Now, I'm gonna mix up kale, mushroom, and the snap peas to go into my generic soup mix. Do I care? No, it's gonna get shaken up, it's gonna be made into meals. This is stuff I would put into a soup for, for my oldest son and I anytime. So I don't have a problem with mixing them all up as soon as they go in here. I just know that because I've got some potatoes in here and I'm gonna have these snap peas, that they are gonna need a little extra time simmering before you can actually serve and eat them. They just need that extra time. And look at this giant meal in a jar. How cool is this? And if I wanted to, I could take some of these tomatoes and throw them in there just like that and they would add to it. And it would just add to your soup. But you know what? I'll take a couple out to show you what I do with them in the end. And that's what we're gonna do. This is a giant jar of instant soup. You can add any kind of grain you want to this as it cooks. And then you've got a meal. Let's see if I can get this. I may have to put it in a bigger bowl and mix it up and we'll do that. Our carrots, our broccoli, the kale that's gone through and fallen through. This is gonna go into our giant jar of soup. You know what? Uh, I need to do this. And here's another word of practicality about trying to make things work for you when they need to work. Did you have a jar of something that you want to add more to later? Yes, do it. I tend to make sure that things are really dry before I add them to another jar, so I will condition them and do all that stuff beforehand to make sure. Uh, but again, this time these dried so long they don't need that. 
Uh, and I try to give myself about a six month time limit of when I add new things to a jar. I just go ahead and start a new jar if it's longer than that because I don't want to add a bunch of fresh dehydrated foods into some that have been around for a while and starting to lose any kind of flavor or texture or anything like that. So I will move the older jar up front to use it first and then just start a new jar with a new. All right, so here is that soup. It's full of peppers, potatoes, kale, carrots, snap peas, corn, onions. You can do this at any kind of quantity you want. Triple the water or the broth if you want to put broth in there. And that's a good starting point for you. Simmer it up, see how you feel about it. If it's a little too soupy, add a little more vegetable to thicken it up some. Or if it's if it's not soupy enough, if it's too much like stew and there's just not enough water, I mean liquid, add some more broth. It's that easy. And if you're getting to the point where you're full uh, and you don't have enough room for everything else to go in, crush it down a little bit. It's not gonna hurt your mushrooms. You'll have mushroom bits. Mushrooms. Do you need to vacuum seal these? You can if you'd like. They don't need it. They will be fine just as they are because it's an airtight seal, so no air gets in or gets out the way this is. But you're welcome to vacuum seal this if you'd like. This will store for a couple of years, just like it is. Something I almost always forget to show, uh, mark your jars. These are portobello mushrooms. And I did these for 23. Now I am gonna go ahead and store my kale. I'm not gonna powder this right now. We have enough powder going for a while and I try to powder only what I need for about a month or two because I don't want that power to degrade uh, in storage. I would rather keep it whole as, as much as possible than powder as I need it. See, just with that quick tamping down, We've got more room. So my youngest son uh, is one of those people that you would call a super taster. He is very, very attuned to texture and taste and everything. It makes feeding him sometimes very hard. It's not that he doesn't like things. It's the fact that the textures bother him tremendously, and there are a lot of things he just doesn't like. So I have found that this is a great way to introduce more nutrients into his diet when he is pretty hard to feed. This can be something that you can do for your family. If they just refuse to eat greens because they don't like the way they taste, use this to just introduce a little bit of green into everything. You're not trying to replace any kind of vegetable. This is a supplement, so you add it a little bit, of a a little bit at a time to everything that you cook where it makes sense, and you're boosting the nutrients throughout the day in every way that you can. Now you wanna see what we're gonna do with those tomatoes? Let me show you. Now here's the big instant soup mix we made. You'll find over time this may settle and some of your finer quantities of things like the onions and things like that are gonna be on the bottom. Just shake it up, you can do that at any point. So I'm gonna leave a link down below in the description box that gives you all a bunch of different ways to use meals in a jar and different ways that you can do that. And you can use this as the base mix for anything that you wanna create. So let me show you one last quick tip about these tomatoes. Okay, here we've got our tomatoes. I'm using just a tiny little bit of this because I put the rest in that soup mix. So you can store them in an airtight container just as they are, uh, like we do everything else. Lids on, store it well in a size jar that is the same quantity as what you have here. Now this few, I wouldn't want to store in a jar this size unless I vacuum sealed it because all of this extra air in the jar has moisture and oxygen there that would create a problem. You wanna keep just the same uh, volume here. What I can do is if I intend to make any kind of meal this weekend that maybe I'm gonna do pizza or I'm gonna do some kind of spaghetti that I wanna add some tomatoes to, but I want that sun-dried tomato feel, I can go ahead and put in some olive oil into my jar, just cover them, they don't need a ton, and I can store them in the refrigerator just like this, okay? You can keep this for three or four days, maybe up to five. That's about as long as you wanna do this for. You cannot store this on the shelf the way it is. It is not even remotely shelf stable. What you do in your own home is your choice, but these are not deemed as shelf stable. Even if you had it full, 
uh, they're not shelf stable. So what you do is just leave it in the refrigerator like this until you're ready to use it. Now this will not rehydrate these tomatoes. It will give you some flavor. What I'm gonna suggest and what I can't show you right now because I've got a stove full of food cooking for uh, prepping for the weekend so I can't get to it. Um, I am, would put these in in a saucepan just like this. And if you need to add a little more oil, you can do that. And then simmer them at a very low simmer, just let them simmer. What's gonna happen is, is that the warmth is gonna make the tomatoes open up. They're gonna start and taking that oil. They're gonna impart, the, get that flavor back and forth between the two, and then you can use them as if they were rehydrated. Now, of course, you can just do it in water. That's fine too, but if you wanna keep that sun-dried tomato, that's how you do it. If you wanna see how I made that big giant soup in a jar mix, watch this video right here where I show you how to do it. And until I see you again next time, keep preserving.